to the return of Geeky Gentleman History Month, the month in which we discuss the contributions that Geeky Gentlemen have made to history, but that have been ignored by a biased educational system, except not at all. I am Sid Part 2, joining me today is... Four score and seven years ago, our great-grandfathers... Oh wait, sorry, sorry. Wrong show. Uh, party on, dudes. Anyway, <laughs> um... So we're starting off History Month. It's always it's always a good time on the show, um, and I decided to take over and do a topic first. And I thought this would be an interesting topic because it's kind of um, it touches on something we discuss a lot on History Month, which are docudramas, documentaries, and biopics. Uh, the basically the idea of taking history and making it entertaining on film, whether that be on, you know, movies, television, what have you. Because uh, I find it to be a very interesting practice that is always full of inaccuracies, whether those inaccuracies be short-sightedness, uh, influenced by particular interpretations of events, or just straight-up decisions to take, you know, as... as is there a term that like goes beyond artistic license to now nah, I'm just making shit up. <laughs> like, I feel like there's artistic license of like, ah, maybe these two characters talked once or twice too. And then William Wallace fucked the King's daughter. <laughs> like there's, there's a large gap between those two worlds to me. Um, so I don't know. I find I find this to be a, a very rich and very interesting um, bed of topic. Uh, Steve, what, where do you think would be a good place to start by talking about about uh, the the art of bringing history to the screen in an entertaining format? Well, so okay. I, I think starting with the accuracy thing is actually really interesting because there were certainly degrees of of how accurate you want to be um whether you're doing something sort of like aaron sorkin style just repeating the facts verbatim and making the dialogue snappier uh or if you're going all the way on to the other side of the, of the plane and doing something like elvis or blonde where it's biographical because the person existed but the events themselves are mythologized and that's what we're examining. And I think living in that spectrum is interesting. To me, I think people get way too bogged down on the accuracy of biopics. And I think they get way too bogged down on the idea that a biopic not including something is the same as it willfully disregarding it or actively erasing it. Um, there was an article uh, about Oppenheimer uh, a few months ago when the movie came out where someone used the phrase, um, omission is not erasure. And that's a thing that I feel like people don't seem to have a grasp of when it comes to, to biopics. And as much as like the preservation of history is important, history is different than art art is a historical artifact and vice versa but i do i do get kind of tired of of people like nitpicking biopics instead of thinking about them in terms of whether they're good movies or not nolan did an interview recently um about oppenheimer where he said he doesn't like the concept of biopics because he said he says 
the moment you start thinking about a movie in terms of it's a biopic, it's because the movie has lost you as a movie. You start thinking about the facts and the biography because the movie's not engaging as a movie that's using genre conventions to tell an enter- entertaining story. And honestly, I think he's kind of right about that. I feel like anytime I'm more interested in the real world events than the movie, it's because the movie sucks. Mm. Now, how do you feel about the the reverse of that, where someone makes such a good and engaging movie, but then it turns out to just be completely fictionalizing the events to the point where you kind of just go, why the fuck did we even base it on this person if it's just this fictionalized? The the example that kind of comes to mind for me is um, Dragon, a Bruce Lee story. Oh, like yeah. I remember watching that that movie. It's like a biopic. It's set up as if it's like you know telling Bruce's life, and and you know it's it's in that '90s era where fucking Oliver Stone made The Doors, and everyone made biopics like The Doors now, um, where there's like a big like narrative um, metaphor that's like chasing the hero throughout the whole thing. So The Doors, you had the naked Indian guy, and um, for uh bruce lee's the dragon dragon the bruce lee story you had the uh the samurai warrior uh stalking him even though bruce lee's from china uh (laughs) and (laughs) but but like it is it's like a whole thing and i remember like one scene in particular is is you've got young bruce lee with his dad and his dad's like we dressed you in girl clothes to hide you from this curse and like the movie ends with um bruce grabbing brandon and and taking him away to to like represent um escaping from the fear of the the samurai warrior a stone samurai i think it is um and then it's just like you you look at it no his parents never fucking dressed him in girls clothes that's just completely like it's just a fucking made up story (laughs) at that point why did they fucking put it around bruce lee Um, like it's a very entertaining movie it's a cool concept and a, a cool like narrative device to use for a movie about someone like that and then oh the fucking um the like brother of the guy that broke bruce lee's back like chasing him down for revenge and then fighting on a movie set. That never fucking happened. <laughs> it's cool as shit drama, don't get me wrong, but it's just not fucking real. <laughs> and and that, that sort of, like, tension, I feel like, is interesting because I don't normally care about that kind of stuff, especially if I feel like the movie's doing a good time. Um, Dragon of Bruce Lee's story is a good example. Um, what's it called? Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is another really good example when mm-hmm. you're talking about Bruce Lee. Uh, and I swear to God, there is about to be an entire generation of children whose only idea of who Bruce Lee was is the arguments Tarantino and Shannon and Lee have been having back and forth for like four goddamn years. They will just not let this shit go. But for whatever reason, right, Quentin Tarantino decided to present a version of Bruce Lee that is not only inaccurate, but is like really really deceptive in terms of what he was actually like on set um and he just keeps digging his heels in on this on this idea of him that's not even consistent with his own previous homages to bruce lee in his other movies and shannon lee keeps fighting him on it because he keeps she doesn't like the idea that that's the image of of bruce lee that's going out there um and i want to preface that point with as much as shannon lee is quote-unquote protecting the legacy of of bruce lee the Bruce Lee estate is also just like hardcore all in for mythologizing this dude in completely unrealistic ways. Um, they are not above board when it comes to th- when it comes to like historical accuracy over getting people to really, really be into him as a figure of pop culture. Uh, and a lot of the projects they do, like the upcoming Bruce Lee anime, where it's just like fucking Fist of the North Star except Bruce Lee, is in that spirit of like, it doesn't matter what happened to the man as much as it's what people's idea of the man is. And um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood takes an opposite approach, where instead of having reverence for him, it kind of shoots him down a peg. And they took real offense to that. And I get why right like if someone talks shit about your dad and makes a movie about it like i'd be pissed too right but 
at the same time, he's not on a, on on a technical level really doing anything different from what everyone else is doing. He's just pushing him down doing it in the opposite direction. Yeah, yeah, like he's just lampooning him. Like he's, it's not against the fucking law or anything. It's not a great take, but it's not like it's any worse than half the unrealistic Bruce Lee movies that are made. Right? Bruce exploitation is its own genre of filmmaking where people take the homage <laughs> and the character and the and the archetype of bruce lee that's unrelated to the man and just kind of run with it uh i brought up elvis and blonde earlier and those are movies that are not realistic at all that completely make shit up and are essentially just fiction based around real people and people were really mad about blonde being mean to marilyn monroe and people were really mad about elvis because elvis was a pedophile and racist and whatever else and I just thought all those people were full of shit because you watch those movies and the movie is about these public idea of who Marilyn Monroe was and the public idea of who Elvis was. Elvis in particular is a movie about like how did the public image of Elvis come to be and what is the toll of taking that public image and transposing it on a man and is that entertainment for entertainment's sake somehow erasing what that person really lived through? And how? And do we even have an ability to care about the real person? Because all we know is the image of Elvis. And I thought both movies were actually really interesting in that regard. Elvis far more so. But none of it's real, right? Like, you don't watch Elvis and then come away with an understanding of who Elvis was, because that's not the point of the movie. Yeah, um, it's... I feel like it's an interesting exercise in what is the intent and not necessarily what is the intent of the filmmaker, but also like, how is the movie presented Mm -hmm. to you? Because I I think the reason that I thought of this and and whenever we talk, whenever we do History Month, even neither of us have been in school in a number of years at this point, um, my mind always goes back to history and its educational value and how it's taught and i guess the the like underlying thing that we're kind of getting at here and and i want to spend some time talking about Mm -hmm. is you can have an artistic intent and that's fine if that's what the filmmaker wants but there is something to the fact that like once you put it out into the world there is I feel like a responsibility you take on in that you know people are going to view this as a reality, um, whether or not you intended it to be so. And the reason I say that is because I went to American public school, and you know what we did in a lot of classes? We learned some stuff for history, and then we'd watch a movie about it. (laughs) And, like, that's just, that is a a very sad, but a very true, like, way in which the, it, generations, plural, have grown up in at least American schools. I can't speak for, for schools around the world. I don't know. I'm going to assume it's not that different. I know American education systems, like, pretty shit, but, like, you know can't be that much more shit than everyone else's <laughs> um, no the world would be in a, a much different place uh but, sorry i'm sorry i'm rambling here but like i feel like that's just a thing that needs to be addressed when you are making something that has its roots in either a person or a historical event that you need to kind of like take at least to some degree a step back about and go Even if I don't want people to, someone is going to take this as representation of fact because it is based on fact, it is based on true story, it is based on a real person. Um, Even if this is the mythologized version of them that that our culture has built up in in cases like Elvis. Um, And so my question is, do you think that, like, filmmakers... uh, for biopics or docudramas and stuff, do you think that they have any responsibility to, like, do something within the context of the film itself, not just statements after the fact or before the fact? 
to truly demonstrate that this is not meant to be taken as reality? Honestly, no. I don't. I, okay. I, I feel like a lot of what a lot of what gets um, people in trouble is not giving individual audiences or people the agency to make up their own minds about these things and not having an audience that is literate enough to come to their own conclusions about these things. Um, the idea that you and I both in, in a lot of ways spent history class watching movies about history instead of reading like many firsthand accounts, at least in like middle school and high school and stuff. Is yeah, it... no, I don't think I read a firsthand account of history, like outside of a random, like, here's a journal snippet in the yeah, textbook. Yeah, yeah. Like a paragraph. <laughs> I don't think I read a firsthand account of history until college. Right, exactly. Which is yeah. so sad. It's, no, because it's that's fucking... how history is learned and studied. <laughs> it's fucking atrocious, right? To say out loud that you were like fucking 20 years old before you read a firsthand account of something. But, no, but like... Uh, I think saying that out loud, right, is an indictment of the way we teach history. Uh, the idea that we, as an audience and as people who are given these things, have decided to present this information to other people. Um, I don't think the filmmakers have a responsibility to, like, put in, in asterisks or in quotation marks or drop a title card or something that say the events that you're about that are witnessing are dramatizations, yada, yada, yada. Um, because I think the media literacy part is not their job. Uh, I think okay. their job as artists is to be artists and to do artistic things. And the idea that other people are confusing that for history is more of an indictment of the culture we're in as opposed to the artists themselves. Um, now, there are there are larger problems here, right? Like the fact that we were watching history movies in history class, but also the fact that so much of history as it's produced rests on artistic representations that are taken as fact by actual historians, right? Uh, classic example the Bible. of, well, yeah, the Bible for sure. Uh, classic Julius example, Caesar. Julius Caesar. Shakespeare. Uh, the Nazis, right? Like the idea of the Nazis comes from the Nazis' own propaganda films about themselves. Um, lots of other things uh, over the course of, uh, over the course of history, a lot of what we take as fact comes from stories. Um, we know as much as we do about Greek figures and people in Greece because of Homer as much as we do from any historian. And it's one of those things where, like, the line is very murky. And unless you're giving someone, like, the, the, the tools or the ability to access the information and come to these conclusions their own, you're not going to be able to separate those things out immediately. And it's a complicated web, but I think part of what makes history and art interesting is figuring out where these lines can kind of converge and where they can separate, but not in a way where we ever draw a clean delineation between the two things. Who Elvis is as a pop culture icon is as much real as who Elvis was as a man, and I have just as much ability to know one as I do the other, because at the end of the day, reading a, a, a completely first-person account narrative of who he was in life is also just telling a story and presenting the facts in a way that gives you a certain idea of who this other person thought he was. And it's a very difficult thing to, it's a very difficult thing to kind of parse out. Yeah. I guess I'm going to not necessarily push back, but just kind of go a little bit of an alternate route here, which is to say that sometimes I feel the dramatization and the changing up and following, you know, quote unquote the icon over the person um what i feel a pitfall in in that kind of uh filmmaking around historical figures or historical events is is often you overshadow the event itself with stuff that is arguably less interesting um i've seen a lot of stuff that takes the idea of the Manhattan Project and makes things around it or about it that like heavily fictionalizes or or heavily deviates from the actual sequence of events when just 
straight up, the actual sequence of events is so much more fascinating and, like, nail-biting drama than, like, anything anyone could ever make up. You know? Yep. And, and I find that to be an interesting, um... It, it, like, a pitfall, almost. That, like, I sometimes I don't understand why we're sensationalizing and fictionalizing certain things when we, we portray events in history um, when just inarguably the events themselves were much more fascinating. Oppenheimer, again, uh, is actually a very good example of this because it's based on the book from the early 2000s, um, American Prometheus. Uh, and the movie mm -hmm. doesn't have, like the usual sort of biopic ending where like they put words on the screen and tell you where everyone ended up. It doesn't do that at all. Uh, but I read the book leading up to the movie and the thing about the movie that surprised me most was the movie actually just like straight up copies the entire structure of the book. It's laid out in the exact same way the book is. It even like shows you the scene of the Trinity test and, vi and visualizes the account in a way that's similar to how the book breaks it up. And entire sections of the movie, like just like a good like 70, 80 percent is just a verbatim from people's actual words and, and talking about what happened at um, at the test site. And it's really interesting, like how almost one to one accurate that movie is to the events of, of World War Two. And at the same time, it's dramatizing them in the way that it's filming its characters and the way it's edited and the way it's shot and stuff. And it's, it's taking this story that it doesn't really change a whole lot of and still using the cinematic language to make it really, really engaging in a way that it isn't even as engaging in real life. Um, the story behind the Manhattan project is really interesting and American Prometheus is a great book and everything, but there is a, there is a difference between the ways certain people presenting facts to you can elicit different emotional responses and sections of the book can feel very dry whereas sections of the movie are really injected with that nail-biting energy that you feel like you would have had if you were living the lives these people were living uh and because the movie is so like heavily focused on oppenheimer's specifically subjective experience of all of this uh even to the point where like it doesn't show any footage of what the bombs did to the Japanese because in the scene where that happens, Oppenheimer turns away and he refuses to look at it. And that tells you a lot about that person, but it's also based in a lot of historical reality. I feel like you, it's, it's a situation where you can kind of have your cake and eat it too. Where like history, yeah, is on its own, very interesting. Um, but it, it is the responsibility of someone to present it to a person in a manner that, that conveys how interesting it is and a lot of the time the best way to do that is either to fictionalize it or put it in the form of some kind of story that has a dramatic drive yeah i'm sitting here and trying to like i feel like i had one a minute ago of an example of something where it's fictionalized the events so heavily and basically just changed them in the process and the events in and of themselves are just more fascinating but it, you know, nothing's coming to mind right again. Um, um, have you seen... I think it came out last year. Um, that movie, She Said? No. Okay, so so um, you remember a few years ago um, all the stories that broke about uh, Harvey Weinstein and sexual abuse in mm -hmm. Hollywood and all that stuff. Um, yeah. Last year, uh, a movie came out um, directed by Carrie Mulligan called... Not directed by Carrie Mulligan, starring Carrie Mulligan... Um, that um, was about the reporters who were breaking that story and is based on a book that ex that explains the, the, the journalistic account of all of it. Um, and it's basically just like a newsroom drama, like it's an all the president's men kind of movie where it's just two mm -hmm. reporters like sitting around desks and interviewing people and talking to people and fictionalizing the events that happened in real life. And it's one of those things where it's not inaccurate it's not wrong about anything, but it's just so goddamn boring that listening to the two actual reporters talk or reading their articles is so much more interesting than watching that as a movie. Uh, Bombshell is another movie like that um, that was about uh, Megyn Kelly and Fox News and that whole debacle from a few years ago. And that's another example where like, I watched the movie and I thought it was fine. 
But then at the end of the movie, an interview started playing um, on YouTube of Megyn Kelly and the people in real life who were part of the movie just talking about their experience and what the movie got right and what the movie got wrong. And that interview was 30 minutes, and that movie is like 90 minutes or two hours. And the movie's fine, but that 30-minute interview was so much more interesting. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. I, I just find that interesting that sometimes the the events get so heavily fictionalized that it it becomes less interesting than the actual history, that if you just had portrayed the actual history more accurately, you might have ended up with a better fucking film. Sure, um, yeah. We're, we've been talking a lot about films, and I, I think, like, docu-series, you know, those things that, like, break up between dramatizations with actors and then, like, a narrator, I think those two kind of um, group together pretty nicely. Uh, the one I think we haven't talked about much is just documentaries, where there's, like, maybe actors, like, physically portraying events, but, like, no one actually says anything. There's no actual dialogue <laughs> or story it's just all narrators and like experts talking and i think those ones are the most dangerous in uh just being like fictionalized um because again those aren't just like played in classrooms right those are played for the public on like television and so you don't just have to be in an american educational system you can just turn on tv and be misinformed about reality and that's like very dangerous <laughs> and, and i think the probably the the biggest cardinal sin of the thing because their their whole purpose is while to be entertaining their whole purpose is intended to be educational whereas like the movies and stuff you can argue well it's artistic license artistic intent Whereas a documentary, the whole point is you're supposed to learn something from it. And if you're what you're learning, what you're taking away from a documentary is just wrong, that's really fucked up. <laughs> Those things in particular can be like really damaging because when they do the reenactments and stuff, they're not like actually concerned about the accuracy for those segments. So you watch them and you start making assumptions in your mind that don't have any weight in reality at all like there is one i watched on the history channel which i mean the history channel doesn't have very much history but back in the day when it didn't have mm -hmm. aliens and it had like actual history shows and shit uh there was one i watched as a kid that was about... <laughs> back when music was on mtv yeah back when music was on mtv <laughs> bad back when mad magazine was a thing you know the golden years <laughs> 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 back, yeah, back when the History Channel had history on it, um, there there was a documentary I watched as a kid, um, and it was just like this. I want to say it was like a mini series or something, but like it was it was just a series where they interviewed historians and they were talking about like the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, and the way they did this was like the most interesting, most like over the top, exaggerated version of it that I think you possibly could. Because here are all of these like stuffy white old dudes. Uh, in their tweed jackets talking about a history and all of these people like they're like like they're like real human beings who exist currently and they like described the events like their goddamn sporting matches occurring in real time and, like it's really hammed up it's not inaccurate but it's it's really hammed up and they would have like music and sound effects and like weird cuts and stuff to kind of like make you feel the emotion like you're watching a fucking daytime drama uh and then they would cut to like the reenactments where like they would shoot the actors from behind and stuff um and even though we're talking about like ancient rome and egypt and stuff it's all just like white people <laughs> and it's one of those <laughs> things time. yeah it's just one of those things where it's like as a kid watching it or even as an adult watching it like you're not picking up on any of it consciously but then over time the more of this kind of stuff you watch the more you you find yourself just assuming the entire world was always historically been white. Yeah, it does. It does kind of like seed an idea, and, and like you know, it's it's fascinating, right? Because the people shooting it probably aren't even conscious, or arguably aren't even conscious that they're perpetuating this. Idea. Oh no, absolutely. Um, so it's 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 absolutely fascinating how these these like problems kind of perpetuate themselves in ways um see i think documentaries are the the things that are the most dangerous because 
on the surface, they should be like the best tool for entertainment educational experience where you get to like learn something, be entertained. It's it's a way to like move yourself forward. And I don't think we necessarily have this problem with documentaries for other things besides history, right? Like science documentaries, the science can be wrong because it gets like outdated or new discoveries change the the meaning of, of behaviors that you're watching, right? But like that's not on the fault of the the documentary maker, right? That's just this was the science we had at the time, this is the way in which it was presented. Fucking nature whatever, right? Those are fine. Mm -hmm. It's it, it except for Shark Week with like the voodoo shark. That shit is fucking, <laughs> have I, have I fucking told you about the voodoo? <laughs> no, have I fucking told you about the voodoo shark documentary thing? I don't think so. <laughs> oh my god, this is the funniest story ever. Because because NPR did this right. So like they they covered a guy who's a sh marine biologist. He studies sharks, and the discovery approach was like, hey. We want to fund, we're, we're doing our Shark Week, we want to fund you to go out in the field, do some research, we'll film you, we'll do some interviews with people, um, and we'll make a, you know, hour of television around it, and you'll get, like, a week of funding to, to go do stuff. And he's, like, being interviewed by NPR, and he goes, oh yeah, I was having a great time doing it, it was super nice, it was so great to have the funding to, to get out there and do some more research, and, and all kinds of stuff. Um, and then... At one point, during the, like, to cameras and interviews and stuff, they they asked me, have I ever heard about a voodoo shark? And I laughed and said, no, of course not. And then I watched the documentary, and they just made it an hour of television about me being out in the field looking for a voodoo shark. <laughs> That's insane. I love that so much. <laughs> so, oh so again, caveat, it's not that, like, you can't do it wrong, right, when you talk about, like, nature or science documentaries, but, like, by and large, on the surface, they're not, they're not as susceptible to the problems that you see with, with history documentaries where... Things are just no. That's just not it. That's just wrong. This is clearly a political agenda that is being um, precipitated. Uh, here's here's a documentary about us trying to prove the Bible. <laughs> like, what the fuck is happening right now? Um, they're, they're... We're like, oh, sorry, for some ahead. reason, history documentaries just seem to be like saddled with with this need to be as inaccurate as possible there's also <laughs> as like, uneducational as possible there's also like an argument to be made though too right where like you can make things that are pure fiction that are extremely well researched and give you an accurate picture of the experience of living in a certain time period without them having to be based on any like sort of real figure. I'm like, we do this all the time. Uh, there's a, there's a novel from a couple of years ago. I really like called a gentleman in Moscow. Uh, and it's just about like this, this um, Russian aristocrat uh, living through um, the, the Bolshevik revolution in Russia and like going from the early 1920s to um, mid century and later and he's just uh, confined to a hotel and he's just like in the hotel like doing his duty have, working in the restaurant downstairs meeting guests and people and actors and people who stay at the hotel and like military officials and watching the country change and it's not based on anything it's not like a real story of any kind but it is a researched account of like life in Moscow at the time and you can't say that it's you can't say that it's a poor representation of that because in a lot of ways it's probably more accurate than most movies we've made about the Russian Revolution. Mm hmm. Yeah. No, it's, it's it's fascinating. So I don't know why documentaries seem to like need to go off and and lean so hard into entertainment as to be just completely you know fictional. Mm -hmm. um, and it. Do you think it's because history has, I 
I can't remember if this is a quote or maybe I'm just dropping a quote. Maybe this is my philosophy quote, <laughs> right? Was that that like history is the history of politics, right? History is the history of political shifts, political changes. And so when you cover events in history, you kind of choose a political side to um, to represent consciously or unconsciously. You either, like, you can just be representing the history you were taught, you were shown to believe, but if you were, you know, from a colonizer, from a, a uh, society of colonizers, and you're going to represent the colonized as savages, that's just... Th you know, whether or not you intended to do it, that's just the way you were taught. That's how you were brought up to do it. Oh, no, no. Um, 110%. There, there's a book I really like that I read in college uh, called Silencing the Past. And it's about what, what he calls the production of history. And he coins this term called ar archival power, where he says essentially, like, you build history out of archives, right? Uh, but two things have to happen in this process. Number one, you have to stitch together the archives you do have to tell a coherent story of what happened. And the way you do that is always going to be ideologically and experientially driven, right? Like, you can't avoid that. But two, what counts as a historical archive is also up for a certain kind of political debate. The book is about the history of the Haitian Revolution, and it talks a lot about how, like, the part, part of why the revolution operated the way it did and it took as long as it did was that for a long time in the historical record people were, who are reporting on and working in and responsible for colonizing haiti didn't think that the people of haiti like physically mentally had the capacity to revolt they just thought it was biologically impossible so dozens mm -hmm. of stories and accounts and like clear red flags that the revolution was coming were dismissed from the historical record because they thought they were all just gibberish. They thought they were all fake. And like that's that's not a that's not necessarily a failure of history. That's kind of how history just works in general. It's it, whoever has the ability to enter something into the archive is the person who's going to become responsible for how people use it later. And recovering archives and putting things into them also necessitates taking other things out and like it's always a sort of a push and pull and this is why i sort of feel like the artists are not necessarily responsible for people coming to conclusions about real historical events because the people writing the real historical events they're doing the same thing they are stitching this together the best they can and they're doing it from a skill set that is about as much artistic as it is methodical research mm-hmm the world's weird man <laughs> um because <laughs> you can't just portray objective truth because there's no such thing right. it's all just dependent upon your perspective um what you grow up learning what you uh discover those things go on but at the same time when you put something to a, a documentary and you're you're intending to educate and, and move along when things become so blatantly obviously false not in an, in an objective sense just in a um like this is so tainted by a a political leaning by a uh, a structure of belief that it can't be taken seriously you can't have any level of like taking a step back removing yourself and like evaluating it um without just being in the middle of it um it, it becomes just kind of i don't know if sick means the right word but it just kind of makes you go like really i can, can't believe this uh we're kind of i we're feel like we're kind so of in a moment like that now right where we can't do the distancing to figure out what's true and what isn't because i feel like over the last 10 years or so, uh, coordinated disinformation, straight up false information, conspiracy theories, the whole sort of alternate like, facts, alternative facts, the whole sort of post truth era that we're in right now, right? Makes it really hard to interpret like what exactly 
is the history of this current moment and what got us here. Um, like a big reason I'm always on my fucking high horse about social media is I, I firmly believe that social media has done a demonstrable harm to all of civilized society and to all of politics. And I feel like we are never going to get to a point where we have sort of clear, more understandable boundaries again without getting rid of all of this fucking TikTok, Twitter, Facebook garbage, right? If you go on Facebook right now and you go to a post that is like clear clickbait or something that says something like um, President Biden signed an act that is going to contaminate your water so within the next five years everyone's going to die of poisoning there will be like 12,000 comments no exaggeration like 12,000 comments from middle-aged white people on Facebook who's like why isn't the news covering this where can I find more information about this he can't do that that must be illegal and people are just engaging with it like it's a real goddamn thing even though I just fucking made it up Uh, and like we saw shit like this happen all the time during the last election and in the 2016 election uh, of all of these cases where like people were, were citing sources for like journalistic organizations and towns and stuff that just fucking didn't exist. And people reported on it like it was real. Yeah. Cause it's like no one actually reads the article, right? They just no, read the not. headline. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So I have a question for you, which is, Do you think that the social media, and this might just be a completely different topic, so I don't know if we want to spend much more time on it, but uh, you've you've raised the question in my head. Do you think social media is the culprit, or do you think it's just that, like, you and I grew up in a generation that is by no means was perfect with uh, journalistic integrity or anything, but was probably the best it's literally ever been, and we've watched it get eroded away via social media because if you look like back to mm, i'm gonna say the 50s is when it really started to get any level of actual journalistic integrity um anything before that is like basically yellow journalism or um gonna just be heavily tainted by uh, an intense subservience to government oversight. Uh, not even, like, out of law or necessity, just because of that's the way that people thought then. I I think it's a little... I think it's both. I think there is, there was this period of time from maybe, like, late 50s, early 60s, up through the 80s, where journalism was getting more powerful and more integral to have an informed society. Um, And then all of that goes away when the telecom deregulations happen and Fox News is born and the 24 hour news cycle becomes a thing in like the nineties. But like, yeah, but like even through the nineties, you still get some decent fucking journalism. There's definitely the ratings changing, but like not, the like, level of sensationalized bullshit that you have onto social media. But that that's the turning point, right? That's when the last yeah. vestiges of the journalism that was doing really well are starting to decline, and when the rise of the poor journalism we see today started. And so, like, you're definitely at a at a moment where like the good is on a really high high and the bad is on a really low low, but they are moving in opposite directions. Um, Mm -hmm. And when you start getting to the 2000s and social media, that's when these things get intensified. There's definitely a lot of infrastructural problems historically that contribute to like being where we are right now. But social media in particular is one, a consequence of those two of those things. And two, its own modern force for driving us towards more of this because social media is the thing that incentivizes us to do this. Before, it was a thing that was occurring at a regular pace. But with something like social media, it becomes its own like money-making industry in a way that it hadn't before. Um, when we're talking now about things like search algorithms being 
designed so that when you return search results on Google, it returns results from sites that you are more likely to believe, not sites that are more accurate, right? Um, mm-hmm. So like if you're if you ask Google, is the Earth flat? And your search history is a bunch of like flat Earth theory, then Google's going to tell you the Earth is flat, right? Like there are there are situations where it'll ebb and flow because these algorithms are still kind of young, but that's where a lot of this is heading. Um, Facebook is the internet for a lot of people. Um, if you go to countries like a lot of Southeast Asian countries and India and stuff, while there is like the actual internet that we all experience, a lot of the poorer people, a lot of poorer countries don't have the internet they have whatsapp and they have facebook and for those people that is what the internet is and how they consume information comes from those sites and facebook is one company that will gear its advertising and what's hosted on its platform based on the investors that are pulling for it and so you have facebook appearing one way in one country because the laws of the investor country dictate they should do one thing, even though they should have no standing in this other country. Um, it's it's a really complicated web, and social media is a is a thing that festers out of a lot of problems that already existed. But it's also it's also become its own monster at this point. Um, so it might be like a chicken versus the egg thing, but I do I I do sort of feel like if you got rid of Twitter, Facebook, TikTok. Um, even fucking YouTube on a certain level at a certain point, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the world would be a better place. It would it would be still extremely problematic, and fake news would still be a thing because it's always been a thing. But it would be a it would be functionally a better place where you could discern truth better. So what you're saying is Ultron was right. He spent two seconds on the internet and decided all humanity needed to die. No, literally, 100%. He is completely accurate. If any human being spent five minutes on the internet in 2015, that is absolutely the conclusion they would have come to. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But back to the the topic at hand, though... Um, I do want to mention one thing, and it's it's another high horse that I get on a lot that we can talk about for a, for a minute if you're okay with, which is um, serial killers and true crime. Because oh my fucking god! <laughs> <laughs> because please, please, it's it's one of those things uh, where you're you're in the same vein as energy, right? Because we're doing a lot of drop, we do a lot of dramas now that are based on real life cases and true crime podcasts and stuff, right? You had the documentary, uh, the staircase, um, about a guy who was accused of killing his wife who fell down the stairs. Uh, and it became this big sensationalized thing about like, did he actually kill her? Did he not kill her? Whatever. And then, uh, afterwards got turned into an HBO drama series that dramatized those events. Uh, this is a thing we do a lot, right? Where it's become this weird sort of feedback loop of like, true crime serial killer thing happens podcast talks about it and gets really in the weeds and gets really popular gets turned into a movie or tv show of some kind another podcast is born to debunk all the things that the movie or the drama thing got wrong then another thing gets produced based off of that and it just becomes this own sort of like vicious cycle uh and a lot of what you were talking about earlier about like the artistic responsibility angle i think comes down to how so much of media can be kind of voyeuristic where you are taking something that had like real consequences and did real damage and if you're not moving it away from those things you might unintentionally be causing more harm to those same people at the end of the day right like this happened recently with the uh the oj documentary series docudrama series right on uh, netflix was it uh i think it was on tv wasn't it wasn't it um what the fuck was it called oh <laughs> shit um it's like american crime story right american crime story the oj simpson one and then there was another yeah. one that was about um bill clinton's impeachment mm-hmm. yeah but like the the oj one had like a lot of uh a lot of buzz around it because mm-hmm. No one told the uh, the people that were involved in the actual case it was getting made. It just became national news again and like a whole like worldwide conversation mm-hmm. overnight because of this really popular, highly produced drama series about it. 
and you had actors portraying these people that were involved in like the trial in real life and you know basically parodying their real words and and it just brought all this stuff back up for these people and these are like heavily traumatic events that are you know just thrown back in their face with absolutely no warning basically oh yeah no absolutely like you have that um you had the the series on hulu i think last year called pam and tommy which was about uh pamela anderson um and whatever the fuck his name is the guy who's the the drummer um for motley crew um but those two were together and they made a sex tape and it got leaked um, and it was essentially just a story of the downfall of Pamela Anderson's career because of the leaked sex tape. Um, and Pamela Anderson wanted nothing to do with it. And after the series uh, came out, she announced her own documentary or book or something about it because she wasn't consulted on the show and she didn't want to be and she didn't want it to be a thing to, to begin with. And you get a lot of these things where like, the sensationalism of people's obsessions with headlines and serial killers and stuff, the thing that made 24-hour news what it is, the thing, the whole fucking joke of Anchorman, right, is that you uh. just make the joke that something crazy is happening and that you're unsafe and people will tune in. And that gets translated into coverage of serial killers and crime rates and shit like that. And that now is people's obsession with true crime. Uh, the fucking... Um... The satanic scare. Yeah, the satanic panic in, like, the 80s and shit, right? Like, it's 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 one of those things where, like, it's based in a certain kind of reality, but it's already such a distorted reality that I don't really know what kind of service you have to the truth when you're adapting these things. But at the same time, when you are, what about all the real-life people that are going to be affected by it that are still alive that don't want you to do this? that didn't sell their rights to the media for you to do this, but don't have the lawyers to sue you for it either. You know, like there is a certain level of like exploiting the real people in order to make the fiction that becomes a problem. I will say, I don't think that factors into whether or not the product, the end result of it is necessarily good or bad, but it is like a more general ethical principle for people who live in the real world, right? Like there, it is ethically fucked up that, that Pamela Anderson didn't want anything to do with Pam and Tommy and it became a big thing and it got her sex tape in, in the news again after 20 years. But the show was also kind of good. Like I liked the show. <laughs> it's so interesting to think about the fact that the sex tape ruined Pamela Anderson's career and trajectory and stuff. Um, and now we live in an era where, like, leaking a sex tape has made, like, the fucking Kardashians yeah. m- so much richer than they ever were before. Like, they were already rich to begin with, but, like, it put them on a completely different fucking level. Um, took them from, like, New York famous to world famous. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's just a, a matter of like how the world changed and the show actually does a really good job of talking about some of that stuff where one of the characters is trying to to sell the tape and he's getting caught up in the shift from people buying playboys and pornos at the video store to the budgeting um evolution of porn sites and webcamming and how that like completely changes our perceptions of sex and access to sex in a way that just kind of like came too late for someone like Pamela Anderson, um, but also had to happen early enough for the Kardashians to take off the way they did. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because you've got like you've got like three sex tapes in that in that time span, right? You got like the Pam Anderson one, you got the Kardashian one, and those are the the two sides of it. And then you've got the middle one there, right? And that's Paris Hilton. Oh yeah, Paris Hilton, I remember this. <laughs> Yeah, so, like, that's the thing. It's, like, because she's, you know, her sex tape leak, it it really did kind of create her career. And, you know, she got to be in, like, movies and she kind of became a cultural icon off the strength uh, or off the back of the sex tape. But, like, there was that initial period where it looked like it was going to kind of spell some doom for her the way it did for Pam Anderson. Um, It's really fascinating how that works. It's, It's so fucking funny to think about, like, Pamela Anderson's leaked sex tape ruined her career. You know, the career that was most famous for 
being the sexy lifeguard where we watched her boobs bounce in slow motion. <laughs> what the fuck kind of hypocritical bullshit? Um, just Jesus Christ. It was a poor women. Just all women. I'm sorry. <laughs> it it's a... not fair. I can't do anything about it, but it doesn't change the fact that it's not fair. No, it's 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 just one of those things where like you can look back on it and kind of like laugh at the hypocrisy and then like very little has changed. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, we're much more accepting of it now than we used to be. I'm sure there's of course always still people like Oh, uh, they film themselves having sex. How disgusting. I'll never watch anything with them. And that's not the reason I'll never watch anything with the Kardashians. But... <laughs> um, <laughs> um... The, the other reason I brought this up, uh, though, like the true crime thing, is I want to, like, real quick uh, just talk about Killers of the Flower Moon. Because okay. That's been getting a lot of heat lately, uh, for I think unjustifiable reasons. But I do want to talk about it a little bit because *Killer of the Flower Moon* was a book that came out in like 2017 that talked about the reign of terror in Osage County um, in the early 1920s and how the Osage Indians were the wealthiest people in the country because they had land rights to oil reserves um, and that people would come in from all over the country to like essentially lease this land and make money off of the oil there um, but the way that the the Indians were given that money were through the process of guardianships where the US government would basically deem them as if you were a full-blooded Indian then you are mentally incompetent and you have no idea what to do with your money therefore we must make this white banker in charge of your money, and they will be the ones to decide whether or not you have access to your funds. Um, and it also led to peace places, people and businesses in that area charging what they called Indian prices, where like if you were selling something to an Osage Indian, you'd hike up the price by several hundred times because you know that you can take more of their money. And so while they were like on paper really rich, they were all tied up in all of this legality that the U.S. government struck on top of them. And then on top of that, um, a conspiracy to like slowly but surely murder off the Osage Indians so that people could get access to their head rights and make money went on for like a good 10 years. Um, and the book is chronicling that and in particular like one specific conspiracy read by, led by William Hale to kill all the people in this one woman's family so that all the head rights go to her and her husband, who is his nephew, and so that they together could like slowly but surely consolidate as much land as possible and have access to all that oil well. Um, it got adapted into a movie that came out just this year, directed by Martin Scorsese, and the book and the movie are really interesting, and I think they show two sides of 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 this historical accuracy and and biopic genre because on the one hand when you talk about things like true crime like i said we talk about like harming the victim again that sort of like voyeuristic tendency that happens and the book kind of has that um when you sit down and read it it presents the whole thing as essentially like a murder mystery uh and it consolidates a lot of the facts to point you towards like one or two bad guys and then, like, after about 150 pages, you get, like, the last chunk of it where it's a little bit more nuanced and says, well, we made this one guy the big, the, the real big bad. But in actuality, there was a lot of things that happened. And it, was, it wasn't just one guy, but it was just the nature of how American white people treated Native Americans and how you didn't need a massive conspiracy to convince any white person to murder any Indian because that's just how racism operates. Which is true and very terrifying, but the book doesn't do, I don't think, a very good job of, like, hammering that point home. And then the movie comes out, and the movie does that, you know, it, from the very first scene. From the first scene in the movie, you know that Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro are orchestrating a conspiracy to murder off Indians so that they can get access to oil rights. And so immediately the movie is, like, you are following these despicable people and you are following them and you're humanizing them and you're spanning the whole runtime with them because you have to reckon with the fact that whether or not you did anything in this situation, you do benefit from it. 
that the problem in Osage County wasn't that William Hale was the bad guy. It's that everyone else was complicit in this behavior and they didn't do anything for 10 years. And that's why so many of the Indians died and that's why they lost so much of their money and that's why all the oil was dried up. That these are not special people, that this is just how racism operates. And at the end of the movie, Martin Scorsese literally looks at you from the camera and says... No one did anything about this. They just dramatized it to talk about how cool the FBI was for solving the case. And nothing fundamentally changed because no one bothered to like stop and introspect about what their role was historically in contributing to this. And that's a fucking shame. And I feel like as powerful as history can be and as powerful as the arrangement of facts can be, some kind of narrative device like that that puts you in a situation where you are forced to feel empathy and sympathy for a character where you're forced to put yourself in a situation where you can like experience as close as possible what that reality used to be can drive that message home a lot harder than just the reporting of the facts and i i feel like killers of the flower moon in particular is a really good example of if i was going to show if i was going to tell anyone about the history of what happened in osage county i feel like you'd get more out of the the movie than you would the book, even though the movie is a dramatization. That's definitely an interesting, I, I think a very valid um, point to make. The The idea that you can, uh, you can connect to someone deeper, on a deeper level and, and quite a bit quicker by showing a dramatization, showing a, um, an artistic representation of the thing. I think is incredibly true. I guess my my concern more comes in when the the idea that sometimes the dramatization can cheapen the reality. Um, Because I feel like this isn't exactly it. This is more that they use this as an excuse to justify racism. Um... But you had, like, a lot of Native American-focused storytelling in film happening in the 90s, right? Mm-hmm. That was, like, a huge explosion of it because apparently white filmmakers just found out about it. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, fucking Last of the Mohicans, Dances with the Wolves, Pocahontas, mm-hmm. fucking a billion other movies um, all came out back to back to back. Uh, and I feel like because of some of the, just the wild bullshit that they put in those fucking movies, people kind of took it as license to assume that the supposed treatment of the people was actually being exaggerated and wasn't as bad as it was being portrayed in the movies, when in fact it was actually kind of worse. Um... And so it's not necessarily that that like that particular example uh, is is the thing I'm concerned about, but more just the the notion of that idea I think can happen where sometimes if you dramatize if you dramatize something too much or go too hard into a dramatization um, for the intention of creating like that emotional resonance then I feel like you can actually kind of undercut it a bit. That's that's kind of a danger or pitfall it can fall into. You can undercut it and make people believe that it just wasn't as bad as that. Um, and I... This one's maybe a little more believable because I've actually heard people both reformed and, and still deeply into it that, like, watch uh, movies or whatever about the Holocaust and will just straight say... Nah, they just make that up. It's just all for the camera. That's not real. Like, it, it wasn't really like that. They weren't really treated that way. Um, and that's, like, legitimately, I think that people walk away believing it. I don't think it's a, an excuse to justify behavior. I legitimately think that people walk away believing that these intensely um, dramatized uh, portrayals of things that have the intention we talked about just a minute ago of getting more to the root of the thing 
can actually undercut the reality in some cases. I mean, I agree with you, but I, I feel like that's a concern that's going to exist whether you're talking about dramatization or whether you're talking about just teaching history in general. Because I think mm-hmm. a lot of the problem you run into when you're teaching history is failing to communicate how real and how dire certain circumstances can be. Um, and when you talk about things like Holocaust denial in particular, right, that movement doesn't get started from Schindler's List is too melodramatic. It gets started from people looking at photos and textbooks and, and going down on Reddit threads that post historical facts and then attempting to debunk them, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And so like that, that it's, it's sort of the same problem on either side, uh, which is why I, I say that like a, his, a historian is a storyteller as much as a, a, a storyteller is a historian. They're both communicating similar things. They're just coming at it from different ways. Um, what it was like to live in the 1960s is something that you understand from not only reading about the 60s, but watching movies from the 60s. Uh, and in the same way, if you were trying to learn history of a specific period and you get really caught up in the details, you can sometimes alienate people who just say either this doesn't matter, they don't feel empathy for what happened, or they just kind of want to flat out deny it. Um, In in college, I I had a lot of people I knew um, who were Holocaust deniers, but also just like, didn't believe like really basic historical facts about the civil war and stuff. And it was because they had bad teachers and it was because they, they didn't have any sort of learned empathy for people. Um, And if you want to get a person to learn empathy in a blind way, if you want to get a person to allow themselves to experience the happiness and suffering of other people in a safe controlled way so that they have that ability for real people outside of themselves, you do it by showing them art, right? Like there have been studies about kids who are subjected to literature from a young age grow up to become more empathetic of other people. And without that level of empathy, no amount of learning actual history could necessarily going to take because without that empathy component, then you're just going to be a skeptic about all of it. I think you're absolutely right. I don't, I don't think there's really anything else I can add or, or think to uh, bring up to that one. And we are getting kind of close to the, the end point of the episode. So I think I'd kind of like to leave it there unless we've got anything else we really, really want to get out there about this topic. Uh, favorite biopic? Um, fuck. Uh... It's a hard one, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, I wasn't prepared. Um, There's a lot of good ones, surprisingly. Yeah. I, I do quite like The Doors by Oliver Stone. I think okay. that is a really fucking banger of a movie. Um, and it just kind of gives you a just... I think it does a really good job of like getting some of the accuracy... Uh, uh, it does a good job of like balancing the accuracy of the life with the um with the like capturing the myth kind of thing Mm -hmm. because it gives you all like that this is why people were just obsessed with the doors and jim morrison in particular like this is the lizard king the fucking sex symbol rock and roll star um but it also and in ways that I think is really smart, gives you a lot of like background detail about Jim Morrison. Like one of the first times you see him in the movie, um, when he's not a kid, is he's like in film school, and they they don't like take time to address. Oh, you're gonna give up this film business to start a band? It's just it's just on screen. It's just presented because it was, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I like stuff like that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a good one. For I sure, think yeah. that's, that's what I got. How about you? Is it, is it going to be Oppenheimer? Um, Oppenheimer, I did. I do really, really love. It's my favorite movie of the year. Um, but it's too like new for me to say definitively if that's my favorite would be. Um, so I'm actually going to go with catch me if you can. I fucking love that's that a good movie. fucking movie. Oh, it's oh, so good. God. Right. Like that's a perfect example of like, how do you make something really entertaining? 
stay mostly true to the facts and still kind of leave you wanting to like look it up without diminishing the experience of the movie. That movie is so mm. fucking fun. <laughs> That's a great fucking movie. I, I love it. I think my favorite thing about that movie is I'd seen it like once or twice. I think I even saw it in theaters when it originally came out. And then I remember we were just, my dad and I were just watching it again because it came on TV. And we're starting to watch it and it's playing the opening credits. And it's got like the, you know, we don't do it as often anymore, but it's got those really cool like animated opening credits. And I'm watching them and I'm like, it's the whole fucking movie. They they animated the whole fucking movie in like the two minute opening credit sequence. That's so fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that movie fucking love rules. It. I love it. It's super underrated. It's it's one of my favorite Spielberg movies too. So definitely, if you have yeah, not seen for it, sure. you should watch it. For sure. All right, Steve. Well, we need a um, review topic for next week. Are you gonna pick Catch Me If You Can? <laughs> You know, that's me to do that. I'm kind of tempted just because it's so fucking good. I really like that movie. Um, Spoilers. We like it, but fuck it, I'd be down. <laughs> uh, no, no, I won't, I won't do that Do that one. Um, there's actually one I've been meaning to watch for a while now, and I meant to watch it before we started talking about this, but I just didn't get a chance to. And I figured it'd be fun because I feel like all of us would have a lot to say about it. Uh, let's talk about Ed Wood. Okay. Sounds good. Cool, cool. Alrighty, that's the one, uh, Tim Burton, right? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, the Tim Burton movie um, starring, you mm-hmm. guessed it, Johnny Depp. <laughs> what? No way, those two work together? <laughs> um... You're never going to believe this. It came out in the 90s, and it's kind of black and white. Did Danny Elfman do the score? He actually didn't. <laughs> uh, I remember a fucking college humor video from years ago. It was just like, all right, get Tim Burton, get, no, get Johnny Depp and my wife. Where's that bucket of white makeup that I cover everyone in? Oh, I love Danny, that. Danny Elfman, we need a score. Uh, I don't know. How about something like, brilliant. I love it. Classic. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, I'm the philosopher. And I am going to go read a book because that's where you get history. Indeed. And we are your geeky gentlemen, and we will be discussing things.